Today's episode is with the wonderful Johnny Turnbull, um, the guitarist for many of the great bands in uh, British pop music. So, without further ado... talking to Johnny Turnbull. Hello. Hi. How are you? How are you doing? All right? Oh, I'm, I'm good, thanks. Thank you very much for being on. Uh-huh. I'm looking forward to this. So, traditional first question. What do you do? Um, I play ukulele, guitar, and a bit of bass. Sometimes sing a bit with the Blockheads and Geldof and World Party and whoever else will have me. <laughs> cool. That, that sounds great. So that's really, really cool. So, what I'm really interested in is when people, you know, tell their story about how how early you're interested in, you know, the interest in whatever it is that you yeah. you sort of become. I was thinking about this yesterday because I knew this was coming up. <clears throat> and I remembered um, the first sort of taste that got me into it was my Auntie Jana used to babysit me because my mum got a job, you know, and she had a big record player with the lid that came down like that. Oh, yeah. pile of records on. So I was probably about two and a half or three, and she put on Wimmerwa by the Weavers. Yeah. You know, and I just loved it. I loved all the bass voices and the tenor voices and the high voices, falsetto, and the beat. And I'd go, I, you know, I just wanted it again, again, again. So she'd lift the arm up and it would just repeat on that, you know. And then she'd started playing me in the Hall of the Mountain King and some Vivaldi or all sorts of classical stuff as well. Yeah. And I just had learned, you know, I, I wanted Wimowa, so I just would shout, Wimowa, Wimowa. <laughs> so it wasn't quite your first word, but not, not far off it then. Uh, yeah, I don't know what my first word was. <laughs> again, We're not Wimowa. No, Wimowa. And then, um, you know, music had got me and we lived near an old airfield, you know, from the war left over. And they used to let the boys brigade or whatever band it was practice for the, the mayor's parade, you know. Mm, mm. I'd hear all this in the wind, pipes and drums and, you know, just mm. pushing over the fields to our house. And uh, I'd run indoors and get my mom's knitting needles, turn them around, get the biscuit tin and start walloping away on whatever, mm. trying to be um, a military drummer. Mm. That just captured me. And then my, my older sister, Anne, used to, had a job, obviously, used to bring back records. And when she started bringing rock and roll in instead of Pat Boone or Frank Sinatra, you know, which mm. was really cool stuff, my sister started buying Chuck Berry, Little Richard, Gene Vince, you name it, all the 50s. Mm because I was born in 1950, it was like a window uh, of opportunity for everything, because everything was starting to come back, you know. Mm -hmm. Russia ended when I was five or something. People Mm -hmm. had more money. There was more goods to buy. And we got a record player, and my sister would buy a record a week. And then we started a record club later on, where Mm -hmm. we'd sixpence of our pocket money in, and it would be, Anne's choice, then Mick, my brother, then me, then my mum, then my dad. And my mum realised I had a, oh, you know, a taste for it. So she'd give me her go. And I started buying instrumentals by the Piltdown Men and the Ventures and all this stuff, you know. Of course, it just exploded. And along came, you know, the 60s with, the Beatles, the Stones, the Who, the Kinks, you name it, everything British, everything American, all melded into one. The Stones were doing, uh, you know, Buddy Holly songs and things. Mm. The Beatles were doing all sorts of covers and on B-sides, et cetera, et cetera. And then they all started writing their own songs and wallop, you had British explosion. It was just magic. So we built up a big... A record collection of singles and EPs. I remember EPs by the King, 
and things where you get four tracks, you know, great. Yeah. But um, the records soon got worn out because we played them so often. The hole in the middle would go bandy and it would all slowly go like that, you know. And um, I didn't have a guitar, but I wanted one. I was playing the egg slice, the egg slice, you know, ding dong, ding dong, trying to get out the egg slicer, hard boiled egg slicer. And there was no musical instruments in the house, although they'd all sing. My mum would sing when she was washing up. My dad would sing. There were kind of Irish, Scottish Geordies, you know, that had all sorts of songs. And um, one Christmas, they got me this guitar. I thought it was a guitar, but it was actually a ukulele. It was four strings. Elvis Presley Teen Time from Woolworths with four strings, and it was kind of in tune. And um, my sister put on Peggy Sue by Buddy Holly and I just fumbled around till I found what it was he was doing. And I went out into the alley, which was like my echo chamber. Yeah. This alley between the houses. And I was there for ages. And then I came back in, it was Christmas, and I played a bit of Peggy Sue. And my two aunties, my mum's sisters, were going, what? And Katie looked at me mum and said, Lily, you better get him a proper one. <laughs> you know? yeah, that's so brilliant. Me and mum got me a little Rosetti six-string acoustic. Well, really hard to play. You know, the action was so high and everything. But I just fumbled around till I could do it, you know. And then my Uncle Joe, who was a merchant seaman, came back one time with a great big Gretsch gold star. <laughs> I'd been to California and also Mexico and all sorts of places. And he was fumbling around trying to do Chuck Berry riffs and I was trying to copy him when he put it down. You know, my fingers were, wouldn't go, do, do, do. you couldn't get the, you know, the span. So I was moving this finger all the way, yeah. <laughs> yeah. playing the bottom E, trying to get riffs out of it. And, I just beat it to death, you know, like I really wanted a proper guitar. But, um, you know... There I are so many things that you, in that, that, Johnny, you were saying, and it sort of, you dropped out for a little while again. Did, oh. but we'll come back to that, sorry, okay. But there's yeah. lots of things there that come up a, um, a, a lot. Um, I spoke to, um, to Chance Hodges, um, and he was, you know, because there's the, obviously the thing about how the music sort of came into the country, you know. So, so when I was learning, which is obviously a bit, a bit later than you, but you couldn't get any decent songbooks. They were all in the wrong key and all the rest of it. So everything you worked out. But at least I could sort of get albums and stuff on import, you know, or I can go up to DeBell's in London and get something. But, of yeah. course, prior to that, you had to know somebody in the Merchant Navy yeah. To bring the, to bring the stuff in. Yeah. Bring, yeah. And my brother was in the Merchant Navy and he used to bring back 78s, you know, um, yeah. and stuff. And, and very similar to what you're saying about yeah. having, we, we, you know, I had an older we, sister that bought Stones yeah. and Beatles records. And, and that immersion in, in the sound of, uh -huh. of, of stuff. I mean, if somebody had a good record, you'd just, oh, can I hear that? Where'd you get that in on the Keyside? Yeah. So on, on a Saturday or a Sunday, the quayside yeah. at Newcastle, but under the Tyne Bridge, would be this kind of ooh, dodgy market. There was all sorts of teddy boys and gypsies and merchant seamen selling their stuff and all sorts of gear, as well as proper traders. And um, that became the haunt of, you know, everybody that wanted to know about what was coming into the country. Yeah, was absolutely. Music or secondhand banjos, or anything you want. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and... When I got a bit older, my friend Kenny Craddock, bless him, a uh, really good guitarist and keyboard player, played with Van Morrison and um, Lord, you know. Um, and he worked in the guitar shop. And we had just seen Spencer Davis play at the Club of Gogo. Right. And Steve Murray, yes, Steve Winwood was playing um, a big harmony rocket guitar with loads of knobs and buttons and everything like that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And he was making it sing, you know. And it sort of fed back a bit in places. It was really grungy, great. We were knocked out, absolutely knocked out. And I said, oh, I've got to get a guitar, you know. He said, do you want one like that? Because we've got one coming in. I went, yeah. <laughs> so I got a Harmony Rocket with all the buds and nods. Right. And that was my 
sort of first proper guitar. It was hard to control actually because going I had a a Vox AC th- uh, AC fifteen. Oh, right. Okay. It was. So when I started a band, we all used to plug into this one amp and rehearse yeah, yeah. in the kitchen, you know. Yeah. And uh, I went in the bright channel because I wanted to sing, you know. Um, and off we went. We we formed a band, me and Colin Gibson, uh, my old school friend, who I still know he produces me now. Um, and we started doing these amazing men's clubs you know like um, go as you please where they'd throw money at you if they liked you <laughs> or, or throw money at you it, if, was, if they didn't I, like you <laughs> hit you with a boy, hit me. my uncle bill was on there he was sort of managing us and he would go on and collect the money and one hit him and split his forehead yeah, I was gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and we managed to do all these um work and men's clubs and then we got a gig at um you know c- cinemas would have you on before the main feature Sometimes Saturday afternoon, you get like 20 minutes or something like that. And we were doing down the road a piece by the Stones and some Chuck Berry, you know, throwing in one of our songs we were trying to write. And then, and it went down quite well. And uh, Mickey Gallagher saw us. Uh, and he had just been with the Animals when Alan Price left. He was, he was in a band called The Chosen Few with Alan Hull, Bumper Brown, you know. And uh, he knew that Bumper Brown and Alan Hull were leaving. So he picked Colin, our bass player, and he picked me as to replace Alan Hull. And I knew not, I didn't know a lot, you know. I knew how to copy Chuck Berry by then. Yeah. But, um, and I used to sing my heart out, you know. But Mickey had faith in us anyway. So we moved over from being the primitives to joining Mickey Gallagher in The Chosen Few. Alan Hull also asked me to do his demos at the same time because he had all these songs, Lady Eleanor, et cetera, you know. So I had my first experience of a studio with Alan where we did a lot of the demos and everything, and he taught me F major seventh. Whoa, you know, I was... Oh, well, yeah, 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 landmark. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, that, was, uh, that was an amazing experience. Uh, there weren't very good demos in them days, you know. <laughs> no, 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 no. I don't know where they are now, but anyway, he asked me, you know, do you want to, you know, we'll form a band. And I had already said yes to Mickey Gallagher to be in the chosen few who had a, a record contract and everything. So I stayed with Mickey Gallagher and I'm still with him to this day because he's our manager in the blockheads and he plays organ with the blockheads. Oh, right. It's a lasting relationship as it is with Colin Gibson, the bass player. Um, but me and Mickey uh, have been through the mill, you know, because we stuck together through thick yeah. and thin, all the all the breakups of bands and terrible experiences with management and with dodgy singers and you name it, you know. Okay. But still battling on, even through, yeah. uh, you know, I call it block down one, block down two. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, <laughs> you, know, you couldn't see the end of that. It was really horrible and we just yeah, yeah. been own together say what we're gonna do and um you know i don't know if i'm jumping ahead here but uh no 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 you keep you keep uh, keep going it's cool um the block had a great career with ian and after ian passed away his best friend derek hussey sang with us and i sang a bit and he sang the difficult ones and sadly derek passed away in block down three yeah uh, our condition and you know we're still getting offers for gigs that were cancelled before lockdown. So we plan to, uh, we've got somebody in the wings waiting um, to sing basically Ian's songs with a couple of Derek songs thrown in. So later in the summer, you might see us on the stage somewhere. Yeah, doing, cool. Doing those good songs because they're, they're too good to let lie. They've got to have a life again, the songs, you know. I'm just looking at a, a set list that we thought we could do for a possible festival, a short set, you know, Sex and Drugs, What a Waste, Clever Trevor, Hold Up, I Want to Be Straight, Clever Bastards, Sweet Jean Vincent, Reason to Be Cheerful, Hit Me With Your Rhythm Stick and Blockheads. Yeah, well... <laughs> and maybe Abracadabra in there as well. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> that, you know, that, that is a bit of a stonking set list. About fifty-five minutes of whoa, hey, you know, have some exactly, absolutely, yeah. 
you, you, you said some interesting things there about, you know, having somebody that you work with that, you know, you went through sort of thick and thin together. Yeah. And, you know, the, the thing is about music and the alliances that you make with the music, they are often incredibly powerful, you know, incredibly long lasting. Yeah. Not necessarily that you, you'd be playing in the same bands as these people, but they become your sort of confidants and, yeah. you know, people that you sort of ring up when, <clears throat> you know, you sort of think, I don't know what to do now. Sometimes it's just a case of just talking to somebody to realise that you're not the only one feeling. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, me and me and Mickey have, you know, been together all this time, but we've also had our times apart. Just mm. when, when we struggled to survive when Don Arden was our manager and Skip Bifferty, we, we realised, because Steve Marriott and Ronnie Lane were friends of ours, they produced one of our singles, and they gave us the tip that Don's not all he looks, guys, you know, so right. we got the heads up that it was possibly mm. corrupt, you know, and uh, yeah. you wouldn't get your royalties, you'd just get a drip feed, petrol money, food money, and that's exactly what happened. <clears throat> and it all came to a bad end in a way when we got threats and things like that, you know, mm. and it was all down to good people in the fringes, you know, in that, that wanted to help you. Chris Blackwell, Terry Doran from Apple, et cetera. It's people that liked you and wanted you to survive kept us going. Yeah. And, you know, Chris would send the food parcels, Terry would send food parcels and things and a bit of money. Somehow we kept going. Mickey got a job with Peter Frampton and Camel. Yeah. But I got a job with Glencoe, with Norman Watroy, you know, yeah. based there who we're still with. And um, yeah. And we drifted apart for a while, Mickey and I, but then somehow Glencoe needed a keyboard player. And <laughs> we got yeah. Mickey back. And Glencoe sort of became loving awareness. We met Ronan yeah. O'Rourke, Ralph Edmonds, etc. And there was people helping them. It's always about people helping what they want yeah. to see. So Ronan had um, various people that shall rename, remain nameless, George or whoever, Baron von Bransag, you know, I don't know if that's his real name, but there were, there were the Shufti and the Carol, Caroline thing along and helping Loving Awareness to become a band that would perform and make videos, etc. Unfortunately, the record company we chose, EMI, didn't like the idea of <laughs> Ronan was too way out um, but we made some music and we met Charlie Charles. We went through 18 drummers trying to find the, the right drummer. And we had some great drummers. Um, eventually we found Charlie Charles. We saw him on the whistle test playing with Link Ray. We oh my all, God, yeah, right. And we, we went to Raf, our manager, and said, can you find out his number? You know, and we, eventually he yeah. rang the Musicians Union. And somehow we got through to Charlie and we got him down to Lots Road where we used to rehearse the Loving Awareness things. And he looked, we had an octopus kit. We bought that octopus kit and he loved it. You know, he was like, <laughs> like uh, we blew for hours and hours and hours. And Norman just looked at me and went, he's the one. <laughs> the Charlie so, drummer and... It's just interesting, isn't it? It's a, the, 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 this sort of chemistry thing. In the yeah. Band, right? yeah. Um, because if you sort of talk to people or, you know, or even, you know, you get young musicians who start off, um, they're always looking for the best whatever. The yeah. best keyboard. Whatever. And sometimes that's just not the thing. To, in fact, it's probably not the thing to do anyway, is it? No. It's to, it's to find that person that you think, oh, this guy, it just... It was, it's not even you can work it out. It's just something you sort of think, yeah, this yeah. is fun. It's true. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, yeah. And so off, off we went with Loving Awareness. It took it as far as we could. And uh, when it all started to crumble and the money stopped and EMI pulled the plug, et cetera, et cetera. It's a long story, the Loving Awareness yeah. story. But uh, we started doing sessions together or apart or in twos. You know, we did Lulu, Al Sharp. Yeah. We did a lot of people. Mm. Charlie and Norman got the session with Ian and Chaz. 
and they made uh, demos for Boots and Panties and eventually Boots and Panties. And then Ian said, we've got the stiff tour and we need to be a proper band. And Norman went, well, we are a proper band. We've got Mickey and Johnny, you know, so we got together with Ian. I mean, Norman had showed me some of the lyrics and I was just cracking up. I thought they were fantastic, you know, and Billy, oh, yeah. reading, reading Billy Ricky Tiggy like a poet. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So uh, we got we got together and um, we were a nameless band for a little while, um, and then one night, uh, well, I think we were just about to start the stiff tour, and uh, Charlie was reading the lyrics to Blockheads. <laughs> and he looked down at his shoes and he looked at his clothes. He went, "In we are the Blockheads. <laughs> mm. Shoes like dead pigs' noses, you know." <laughs> Uh, conflict back of jackets, catalogue trousers, a mouth what never closes. Um, mm. And uh, Cosmo went, yeah, the blockheads, Cosmo Vinyl, Ian's publicist. So, mm. so he'd go on on the stiff door and he'd rouse them up, the audience. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, Ian Joe and the blockheads, oi, oi, you know. And we come storming on, of course, we had the songs because the, the people would sing Sex and Drugs rather than watching the detectives, you know, my arms go and yes. so we yes. became behind. there was no headliner on the stiff tour, but we were the unofficial yeah. headliner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, if we were on last, we'd get everybody back on stage and every with the three drummers, you know, yeah. five singers, loads of other people, and we'd all sing sex and drugs. And the stage was like 33 people or something, all chanting sex and drugs, and the audience. And it, it that just became, you know, our swan song. I don't want to mean swan song but you know it was like the yeah, anthem, I know I know I know you know, what you mean. Mean. anthem maybe it's the anthem for us yeah. and serving yeah and uh yeah. after the stiff tour we did that big tour of Odeons we did all the Hammersmith Odeon Lewisham Odeon Odeons in Edinburgh Odeons in Birmingham and they were great even though the audience was sat down they were mesmerized some of them got up Ian made them have a space for wheelchairs at the sides etc Proper gig, you know, proper yeah. look at um, gigs. And um, we made some great records then, you know, including Reason to Be Cheerful, Hit Me With Your Rhythm Stick, What a Waste, all those things that were singles. Um, unfortunately, some of them didn't make it onto albums, you know. It was a mm. sort of stiff policy of not putting the single on the album, which I thought was a bit crazy. No, I didn't realise that. Yeah, they they on the reissues. You know, let's do the gold vinyl bit of this, you know, and then we'll put Hit Me on it or we'll put yeah. Sex and Drugs on it. But, um, yeah, the first ones I don't think had um, the singles on, which was very strange, but we we, we corrected it later on. Uh, yeah. And off we went round the world, you know, we did... Um, uh, semi-disastrous tour of America supporting Lou Reed which was eventful yeah uh, I bet because that's that's a bit that's a bit strange isn't it I mean yeah. how I was going to say because obviously a lot of Ian's lyrics were so you had to be part of the of the lingo if you see what I mean to yeah. really get that and I could imagine that like Bill of Ricky Dicky a lot of that would be just Completely no, the, over the top of the heads of most Americans, yeah, and this, yeah, it was got, it was strange. In some places, they got it, you know, maybe in Detroit or Boston, where there was an English Irish something going on. Yeah, they they, yeah. Yearned, they yearned to understand, you know, and have the lingo yeah. thrown out. Yeah. yeah, but other places, it was hard, you know. Mm. Um, we did that with Lou, and then we went off on our own and did various like. Um, gigs in San Francisco, LA, San Diego, wherever, which were very strange. Um, and the record company didn't have much um, faith in this crack in America. Um, so we never went back with Ian, that was it. We, Australia and that New Zealand, that was a different ball mm. game together. They, they loved it in Oz, you know, we, they went mm. mad for it. And, uh, <laughs> uh, New Zealand too, although New Zealand in those days, 19... 80 or whatever it was, it was a bit of a time warp, like going back to an Oxfordshire village in the 50s, you know. Going yeah, to I was going to say, I was going to say, it must have been very weird. Yeah. yeah, but it was enough of them wanted 
we were in the punk thing, but we weren't punks, you know what I mean? We were sort no, of something yeah. else. And, uh, you know, we started doing songs like In Betweenies and Dance of the Crackpots and all this stuff. And it was, uh, that's not punk, you know, <laughs> yeah. it's a different thing. Yeah. Um, and in England, well, Britain, we had our audience, you know, we had our fan club and everything. We could carry on and, and some European places as well. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, we met great, great people. We had, we always had strange support acts, <laughs> like that, which we loved. And um, I just skip a bit and see how to tie up how people help you thing, you know? Yes. Yeah. 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 <clears throat> Is that, the, the friends you made or nearly made or people you influenced or people that liked you in the shadows, you know, seem to come to your rescue later on when times are hard. And that's exactly what happened to me after Ian, after Ian and the blockhead split up. Um, I can't remember the sequence, but it was all about, uh, I'll tell you the story, right? I'm doing my friend a favour and, playing with Banana Rama, rehearsing, because they wanted to go on the tour, on tour. And I wasn't that happy, really. And I was saying to them, well, who's going to sing those harmony bits, you know, in the desk? And they'll go, oh, no, we're all going to sing the top line. We're all going to sing the songs. So me and Pat, see, well, look, each other went, that leaves us, that leaves the band to sing what else is on the record. And that's pretty crazy. Anyway, I went home that night, disgruntled and like the phone rang. And God bless him, it was Paul Young. Did you want to come play guitar? Yes. Yeah, I bet. I Rescue that. me, Paul. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. I knew Pino Palladino, my yeah. old friend from the Kirsty McCall down those days, was on bass. And yeah. it was going to be great, you know, and Paul had a great Yeah, oh, the band was fantastic. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, off, I, off I went with Paul yeah. and it was a massive success all around the world. Yeah. And when that came to an end, there's a little bridge to... Talk Talk because Talk Talk we had played together in at Medem I think in the south of France that publishing thing and they saw me and they liked me when they needed a guitar player the phone rang he said do you want to come play a guitar yes you know yeah yeah, really, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're great songs I've got a bit of memory loss about how we rehearsed or where we rehearsed but when I saw that um, Talk Talk live in Montreux concert on the internet i went blimey we were a great band i can't remember mm. much person at all but god mm. we got it together and it was just fantastic you know mark's songs were great as well and the, you know that's how things happen it's just out the blue it's like um at the end of the spiritual cowboys with dave dave stewart and the spiritual yes, Cowboys yeah. after you with next now and we had tried to make it a success we had a great time we met great people but it sort of came puttering out and I lived up the road in Crouchen from his studio, you know, the church studio. Mm. Worth the studio manager said, your gear's all here still, your boogies there, there's guitars everywhere, you know, where Dave's throwing a party for Bob Dylan because he's made friends with Bob, you know. Uh, do you want to come? And I went, yeah, 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 cool, cool. And I was sitting on the set here and I was like, oh, I don't really want to go out, you know. And the wife then chased went, get your ass down there. <laughs> so off I went. I put some harmonicas in my top pocket of my denim jacket in case Dylan wanted a jam, you know. And he looked at me as, as I walked through to him. He goes, oh, like that. <laughs> He's still in his sweat robe from the Hammersmith concert he had just done, you know. Anyway, it was um, a funny party, but I ended up in a huddle with Bob Geldof, Sabrina Guinness, who was his minder that night, and Carl Wallinger. And we were all... And uh, Carl goes, oh, I'll be back in a minute. I just want to talk to Eric Idle. And he went off to talk to Eric Idle. And Geldof goes, do you want to come play with guitar? I went, yeah, where are you go? And he went, Canada, America. I went, yeah, OK, when's that? He said, November. I said, sure, sure. Carl came back and Bob went off to talk to somebody and Carl goes, hey, um, do you want to come to Germany and play guitar? We're doing Germany first and the rest of Europe. I said, when's that? He said, oh, I don't know, late, late. You know, yeah, I do it. <laughs> so by going yeah. to that party, I got two gigs that lasted 25 plus years. You know, it was a bit of juggling going on because it was still in Blockheads things. Yeah. So. But I managed to dovetail all those things 
without getting a debt for many, many years. And then eventually had to get a debt for Geldof. Um, I couldn't get a debt for the Blockers, so I had to do the Blockers gigs. And somehow, magically, most of the World Party things seemed to be on different times to Geldof and the Blockers. And it was a great period of changing hats. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I know. And did you know this In is the so harmony with Carl and and then go back to Blockheads and then going back to Bob. It was I really enjoyed that. It, that was you know so fulfilling for me. Yeah. Do you know that that's interesting you're saying about how it all manages to sort of dovetail together because it's quite again, this is another thing that comes up in conversation. I was talking to I think it was Richard Bailey, the drummer, Richard Bailey he used to he used to be in incognito, but he was on um he was the drummer for Blow by Blow with mm -hmm. Jeff Beck. Um, a very similar sort of thing about, you know, the, the sort of bands he's worked with and how it, it would do that type of thing. You know, this would finish, this would start. Yeah. You know, this would, this tour would stop and this one would start. And it's like like somebody's organising it, but there's there's <laughs> yeah. no organisation really going on. It's just chance. I thought, when I thought about this, how it had happened, and I was explaining once to Geldof, you know, we we're talking about our lives and how lucky. And he went, you're blessed. You know, and I was like, oh, that's it. I'm blessed. Somehow I'm mm. blessed with like good mm. fortune when it comes to getting a gig, you know. Yes. Yes. I mean, but if you're, if you're easy to work with, Johnny, then that's what happens, isn't it? You know, if you're somebody who's, who's you know, got a, that. You're, you're probably right. But I think it's to do with, I like lots of different types of music. Yeah. yeah, I loved going with World Party because the songs were fabulous and we could sing these close Everly Brothers type harmonies. And, yeah. and then I could go back with Bob and it was the solo act. So we're doing all his solo songs and we had accordion, penny whistle, guitar, bass, drums. And it was a different vibe, which I really loved, you know, yeah. different styles. It would, it would go a bit Irish-ish, you know, and it would yeah. go back to rock and then of course, we do Rat Trap or Mondays from the Boomtown Rats era songs and the audience would go wild. And that that was fulfilling as well, because you felt like you were in a hit band. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I remember uh, you, I remember seeing, um, probably on Facebook, you posted something about Live Aid um, and yeah. being with, with Paul Young and, and a problem with a, a dressing room or something. Well, yeah. Um, uh, there was a few like that. It, the main <laughs> one with the dressing room was Live 8. Oh, you know, Live 8. It, right, yes, yes, yes. Uh, yeah. And, you know, Geldof had been on the phone many, many hours trying to get the Floyd together, trying to get this band together, trying to get so-and-so to do it, you know. You know, luckily, they all agreed. Thank you very much for doing it, everybody, and Madonna and everybody else, you know, and the Floyd. But so... He wanted us to do obviously one song, maybe Mondays. So I, I just went with my little ukulele, but ding, 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 you know, if we got it. But we didn't have a dressing room. And um, I think we shared people's dressing room. I remember being in Robbie's dressing room with Chris, who was Chris Sharrick, my friend, was on drums with Robbie. And, um, you know, we were hanging out a lot because we didn't have a room. <laughs> We were hanging out yeah. as Madonna came in and uh, it was just like uh, you know, McCartney and a Bono, all these people milling around. Uh, and then we went in the to hang out in the green room, which was the Hard Rock Cafe. And there was Posh and Bex installed on this settee, you know, <laughs> holding court and everything. It was just a fabulous afternoon um, of of amazing acts and we felt like gypsies in a way you know, like little tinkers and uh going in people's rooms every anyway we went on and we did mondays and he made a little speech or whatever it was really good gathering it was frightening to look out on from the stage as was live aid because you didn't want to look up because it was just it went back as far as you could see it at hyde park yeah, yeah. and the next night at uh, Murray Field, I think it was in Edinburgh, you know, the rugby, is it the rugby stadium we did? And Mandela's speech was on. And I was stood next to George Clooney and Susan Sarandon here, you know. And it was all these film stars and we were watching Mandela's speech. And it was, oh, you're getting the shivers because they, everyone in one of the stands had these white cards that they 
raised like that. And it was a great big picture of Nelson Mandela. <laughs> then Oni came mm. on the screen. Nice. It was really good. Um, but uh, it had a tinge of sadness at the end. <clears throat> um, I had to get back. And so did Annie Lennox. So she said, you know, uh, somebody's lent me their plane. <laughs> it's one of it was Branston actually <laughs> lent the plane, a little plane. So we got back to London, and it was great to see Annie again. I had a good chat and everything because we were friends from '77 or something like that. Um, so we had a great natter, and I got dropped off, and Vince was driving me to Crouch End, and then police stop at Highgate Tube. I went, what's going on here? This is a bit strange and the road was blocked. I said, I only live just there, you know, just, and the policewoman said, okay, let him through. So anyway, I got home, I got to bed. The next morning, the wife said, I've got to get to Kent, drive me to the station at Highgate. So I drove her to the station and just as the station master was closing the gates like that, and she went up to him. She said, "What? Well, what's going on? She said, he said, just go home and look at your television. So we went home and it was 7-7. The bombs were all going off mm. all London. And we were still high on what we had just done the night before at Live 8. Mm. And I searched and searched, nothing. There was nothing about Mandela's speech or Bob or nothing. It was all just terror and mayhem mm. uh, it's just you just took the wind right out of the rock and roll sales i had going up mm. and that was um that was a very very sad day mm. it could be the opposite if that terror hadn't happened it could have been Do you know that that's that's a real sort of um such a paradox it was probably like that you know weirdly even more potent. Yeah, because it's a memory, it's a memory for sure. Because yeah. I, like the night before at the stadium in Edinburgh and then flight back all jolly with Annie having a glass of wine in the chat. And then, <clears throat> oh, you know, glued to the horror on the telly, everybody was, instead of yeah. saying, oh, did Bonnell make a speech? What was Bob like? You know, there was nothing in the media at all. It just got no. buried. Yeah. And so to end the poverty you know for the third world it was just gone yeah. uh, that was very very sad anyway on to, on to happier times yes uh, we just done um, the first gig for two and a half years with uh, Bob and the Bobcats in Stuttgart yeah. and it, right. it, it has two sides to it as well the good and the bad it was great to do the gig but it was the first time out since lockdown so let me tell you, Heathrow was a fiasco. Two hours to get searched, to get into the airport, you know, past the barriers. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how many times people asked to see my ID. It was just passports, passports, passporting, passport. took ages. Anyway, eventually, after lying, or sitting on the tarmac in this plane, delayed for an hour, we took off and we got to Stuttgart at two minutes to 12, the airport closed at 12 midnight. Anyway, we get off, we get in the, through the passport thing, which took ages as well because of Brexit bollocks. We get into the baggage hall and there's a lady handing out leaflets. Sorry, but none of the luggage or equipment arrived in Stuttgart. So we're there with what we, what we were wearing, you know, because we had checked bags, guitars, pedals, everything necessary. So somehow, because it was Stuttgart, well, Leonberg, this is the T-shirt here, Leonberg, right. um, we were able to hire quite good guitars, and amps and pedals from Stuttgart music shops. So Geldof got a couple of acoustics, I got a couple of Les Pauls and a wah-wah and an overdrive. <laughs> We did the concert, uh, open air, Leon, uh, for five day festival. We were headlining one of the nights and it was great to be on stage. It yeah. was really like, you know, nervous, but fired up and up for it. Um, even though he fired, I think four new songs that weren't originally in the set on us, we managed to do them. 
and we had a great night. Um, when we got back to Heathrow, all our luggage and gear was still there. And uh, we had a connection through somebody in Bob's office to get somebody in baggage control to sort it out. So we got our little wheelie bags back and all the gear went back to the farm storage, which I'll see on this weekend. We're going to Greece. So out of that disaster, somehow we managed to do a festival for the first time for two and a half years, which was a great vibe. Yeah. I is loved it. it. Is, is it... <laughs> Yeah, there's something old about this. I don't know. You know, it seems like everywhere is short of staff. Yes. You know, um, nothing seems to be arriving anywhere. You know, it's like the whole infrastructure is falling apart. And you, you yeah. look at that and you sort of go, well, okay. So and you, if you ask people, why is that? There's, nobody really seems to know. You know, somebody goes, oh, well, you know, somebody said to me the other day, well, all the poles have gone home. I mean, it's a bit like, yeah, but it can't be just the Polish. I mean, it must, but there does seem to be like, either it does, it almost seems like people have forgotten how to do things. Yeah. But, yeah. I mean, I, we were reliant on Croatians, Lithuanians, Poles, et cetera, et cetera. That might be, the, yeah, that might literally be the answer. Um, like strawberry pickers, they're always going on about. Oh, my God. Well, I, used to, I used to live, um, I used to live in in Kent, right in the, the what was the strawberry the strawberry belt, belt I suppose you could call yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and it was it was full of people from Eastern Europe originally. Yeah. So I don't know how they get on now. But. Yeah, putting the light on. This storm is coming. Oh, the big storm it's gone all dark here. All right. Ah. <laughs> so you. Yeah, so obviously you've had similar weather to us. Do you want to hear my lockdown Brexit song? <laughs> yes, go on then. <laughs> well, Brilliant you know, stuff, when, when it was lockdown, I, I reverted back to being about 12 or 13 and playing finger style on the old Hofner and got the ukulele out. And we moved into this old cottage here. Yeah, I was uh, going to say it's an old cottage. I'm just looking at the beam every, behind you. Everything is broken. And this is oh. the song. Everything is broken and them right chased off. The toaster and the telly and me banjo in the loft. The dishes in the sink, the glasses on the blink. I'm checking my old man to see if he's still in the pink. I'm grumpy and I'm thirsty, so I think I'll have a drink. Cause everything is broken down. Yes, everything is soaking where the rain came in. The gutter's overloaded cause the pipe's too thin. I rang the local plumber. Of course he isn't in. I'll have to set about it with the rolling pin. I'll open up a ruby and pour myself a gin. Cause everything is broken. Yes, everything is broken. I just can't believe me look. The washer and the dryer are completely Donald Duck. And this is in the clink. Bank is on the brink. I'm checking my account to see if she's still in the pink. I'm grumpy and I'm thirsty. I think I'll have a drink. Cause everything is broken and not blood is joking. Everything is broken down. Fantastic. That was brilliant. It's all true because oh uh, the gutter in all that, in the concert got soaked in the storm. The washer went the dryer. <laughs> I was going, oh, bloody hell. And I had nothing else to do but sort of write it down. Oh, listen, I found, I, I moved the computer and I found this half a poem I had written this morning. I didn't know right. how, how long it's, it's been there a few weeks. Goes, uh, the thin white duke with a studio tan, the four day growth on a stubbly man, the cats and the kittens, they get it while they can. It's all on the rag they call Facebook. Gadgets for this and cures for that. Lost causes and tit for tat. Bobby Billions call to arms. Indian farmers without any farms. <laughs> I've got so far. I'll try and finish it off. But one day Facebook just changed and it was like, I was going, where's all my shit gone, man? You know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, just pictures yeah. of Barry, pictures of Bob, cures for this, pictures of cats. And I was going, I was into this, um, this uh, Hindu guy, Moha. Right. Uh, and I used to get the his podcasts and things like that. A lot of other yeah. 
you know, um, I go down rabbit holes, man. You know? Yeah, yeah, and so it, do I. It all disappeared. It all disappeared. It's hard to get it back, you know. Oh. I just thought, well, what have they done? Oh, because no. I've got yeah. two Facebooks. I've got Johnny, Johnny at Johnny Turnbull, JT Blocker, which is all music things, and I've got my Johnny Turnbull, which is anything I want to publish or mm. anything I could talk about, you know, in the world. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and they both changed and they got stuck on the music one. <laughs> it's like, I don't want to publish something semi political or dodgy on the music channel. The music channel is just for yeah. music that I'm involved with, or you know, like it's like um, your own little diary of I can put the talk talk stuff up and the old links, Dave stuff, and everything, <clears throat> but. Eventually, Emma sorted it out for me. The back is two separate items now. So, but it's radically changed. This <clears throat> met, meta, what, meta, meta, yeah, yeah. Oh no, man! You know, don't. I've had goggles on. I've I've been there when it was being developed. You know, yeah. uh, this friend of Geldof showed us this another world, and it was amazing. The potential of it was amazing for a lot of different topics and things. And for people to show off their, uh, you know, talent with yeah. doing the 3D things, but I don't want to go there. I want to, I want to be in nature more. And you know, I can walk out of here and walk up the top of the garden. It's a hundred yards, and there's fish, and there's rabbits, and there's foxes, and there's birds. Yeah. And you know, it's that's. For me, better than. <laughs> yeah, no, no, you're absolutely right, and I think, <laughs> okay, you know, here we are chatting away on Zoom. Um, you know, we we got uh, off the music. We got off music talk a bit. Sorry, I. I, I no, no, we... no. It's this is there's a lot. You see, there's a lot of stuff about because obviously I, I, you know, I, I do lots of creative stuff anyway, um, and and I think it's really important for people to. To understand that you know anybody who's creative is involved in any creative industry they've got a life yeah and they've got an experience of life that you could you know it's not directly related to music per se or or acting or whatever it's just it's just your view of the world and a lot of that stuff is about getting out getting out in nature you know and and and, and experiencing life and being able to like like in your song you know um sort of the uh you know being able to put all of the things in a humorous way which are actually pain in the ass yeah yeah which again really i suppose you know ian jury's stuff is oh, ian, ian used to write so many lyrics one time i was around his place in Hampstead, and he used to write on great big a3 is it the big huge full scout mm. mm. And the couplets he had, it was like, and lines through it. And he was throwing away some amazing lyrics and whittling it down. I mean, Sweet Jean and Hit Me had a lot more in it on the draft that I saw. And some of it went in the bin. I hope Baxter got, <laughs> got in the bin and got them out because the outtakes were great as well. But yeah. um, he, he honed it to perfection uh, as far as I'm concerned, especially on... Hit me was like a chant originally, and we used to he'd go hit me with your rhythm stick. We go hit me, and then he'd go beef burger, chips and beans. I want, and I got, I want an omelet. And Davey went, a nice cup of tea, a nice cup of tea. We had all this stuff. We were going around radio stations chanting hit me, but it didn't have all the verses then, you know. Uh, until Chad said, "I've got this tune," and Ian really honed it into perfection, as I said, you know. So, and I remember we, we recorded it. Uh, I think we took like maybe eight or something. We chose the second take, I think it was, which was the one we worked on. Um, and we had a ball. And at the end of the session, we realized, hey, you know, this is this is good for us, and it might be good on the radio as well. Yeah, <laughs> we were going up to play. Very soon after that, we went up to play in Kilburn. At the, I think it was the Globe or somewhere like that. I can't remember where it was. We were sat outside in the van and it came on the radio. 
And it sounded fantastic, you know. Mm-hmm. And we realised then we were all sort of going home that night, ringing with mum and saying, we've made a hit record, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, it, li- as soon as from we the- realised it was on the jukebox of our pub, you know, at the local, that was it, because everybody was like, put that on again, put that on again, you know. Yeah, yeah. And then they start playing the B-side, Clever Bastards, you know. It was like, yeah. what? Here we go. We had a hit. It was a brilliant feeling. Yeah, yeah. Well, it was a fantastic song. I mean, yeah. right good from the... production as well. Laurie Lathan, yeah. really yeah. good. Yeah. Laurie did yeah, a cause... great on a lot of, a lot of stuff, um, especially Mr. Love Pants album. I thought his production was immaculate on that. He took his time. He was a bit of a perfectionist. Mm. And it, it was still the old days then. You know, there wasn't too much um, technology in the control mm. room. It was down to the time spent by the engineer and producer so that you could hear the difference between Chaz's guitar, my guitar, the organ or the synth or wherever, you know, the saxophone or flutes or clarinet. So everything had its little pocket. That's what yeah. spent the time on. And especially mm. vocal had to be vocals up, you know, mixed vocals up. So you could hear the words because it was all about the words. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Brilliant stuff. Um, so now you, you now you're out of block down. Um, yeah, yeah. So so you've got you, you, you were saying about the, the stuff with with Bob Geldof. Yeah. So what what else what else have you got? Some blockhead stuff coming up. We've got we've got a possible um, uh, getting reunited with the blockheads later on in the summer maybe August, September at some, we might appear at some festivals. It'll all be on our website. Mm. Um, and I've got various in Europe with Bob. And then I have to get back to uh, when, when lockdown happened, I was recording my second solo album down at Lofty's near Toaster. And I came away with 20, some mixed, some not mixed, some to work on, some to put to bed, you know, yeah. And I never went back there. I couldn't go back. It, you couldn't go out. You, you know, Lofty wouldn't allow anybody in the studio. That, that was the end of that. So I'm sat with 20 semi-finished songs and some instrumentals to choose from. But, you know, as time goes on, and it's two and two and a quarter years ago, I think, or a bit more, um, you write more songs and you have more ideas. Yeah. Oh, I must have probably 35 things that need attention, you know. Mm-hmm. Some of them are quite simple to remix or do the vocal again and then put it to bed. Other ones need uh, sorting into, not categories, because I like so much different types of music. My albums yeah. are very, very eclectic and and mixed uh, things. Uh, so I'm quite excited. Um, I might be changing studios and going even further south, which is a bit bad for me because I live north. Yeah. But uh, I, I, I lost the knack of logic and things like that. You know, I had it at one point and then it died. I had another, I had a DPS 24 track, which with the proper faders and everything, and that died. I lost everything on the hard drive they couldn't resurrect it they couldn't fix it i couldn't get it back so i just let it go but then i started finding monitor mixes i had done on and made into a cd you know right for a memory and lofty made some of them much better broadcast quality and then i'd put on a slide guitar or something on the top freshen it up with a martin here and there made them sound current if, if that's the right word you know made yeah. them yeah, yeah, yeah. like this is happening now even though it was from way back when the machine died two three four years ago wherever um and so i've got all these songs and instrumentals i've, I've sent quite a few off to bob because he likes to hear other people's music and then put lyrics to it and i've wrote a few songs with him in the past and with Carl as well from World Party. Um, but, you know, as it's a solo thing, 
uh, well, there's various blockheads playing on different things and some other people too. My friend that sadly passed away mid-game in the, the harmonica player, uh, Martin Walker, the keyboard professor. And But it's a lot of it is me playing absolutely everything, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, which is great. I like to dabble in synths and play a bit. I mean, I, as I heard, said when I started out I wanted to be a drummer when I was little you know yeah 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 if you put me behind a kit I'll just play to my heart's content you know jamming along with whoever Chaz or whoever playing I'll have a great time playing percussion I'm not that good a drummer but I can sort of hold the beat you know yeah. and I'd like to be a good drummer and I've got I haven't got a kit yet but I've got all old Eurythmics congas and bongos and all sorts of things you can shake and rattle and roll with, you know. Yeah. So it's good fun um, still, you know, even though I'm old now, <laughs> uh, to, as I said, you know, sometimes I go back to when I was 12 and playing like Fingerstar Chet Atkins and yeah. having a ball with it, you know. It's just great. Well, this is the thing, isn't it? You know, about music. Yeah. You know, it, 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 it. well, in fact, I, I've played around with this idea about returning to material that you recorded years and years and years ago and listening yep. to it. And yep. and it takes you back, yep. not just metaphorically, but I think it, it does something to yeah. the way that your memory works, that oh. you start thinking again like, I don't know if this is true for you, but it's certainly true for me. I start to think again like I'm that age, you know, yeah. I've got suddenly a, a bit of a sparkle and ideas come to me <laughs> that I used to get then. Yeah. And maybe I haven't thought like that. And there is something in that. And I don't know what it is. I, and I certainly don't yeah. want to try to e explain it. But you, you no, know what I, I mean? exactly what you mean. It's like, um, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. Hang on. Get the mark. Oh. <clears throat> I've got a lovely guitar tree behind me there with all sorts of... Yeah, yeah, I can with, see now. When, now you've got up. This is my Martin F50. Wow. It's from 1960. Um, uh, and I started playing like this, you know, at the beginning of Blockdown 1. I was playing a... <laughs> Wow. Know, with a thumb and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. With the old rock and roll. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, it's a lovely instrument. It's good when you plug it in because it's got an old uh, diamond. Yeah, yeah. Good, but I just like it acoustic as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. I well, thank you. That, that's, that was wonderful. I mean, I've, I've even started sometimes, you know, uh, on the last rehearsal and concert with Bob, uh, I just grabbed the pick and started playing finger style on some things with my thumbs. Yeah, yeah. It's such a difference. I mean... You know, I don't attack it that much because I split my nails, but yeah, yeah. the feel of your thumb on the bass and then yeah, these yeah. these fingers and then a bit of nail, it just gives it a different um, yeah. different quality altogether. Yeah. Yes, it does. And, and, and again, similar thing. It's like this thing that you pick a, a, a certain guitar up and it, and it, and it plays you. Yeah. Sort of thing. I know. And you pick another uh, one up and yeah. that plays you. And, well, and, and you know, I've always said that's, that's the reason why we should have umpteen guitars, yeah, as women have shoes. Guitars. Yes, exactly. That's exactly what happened. This is what happened. When I saw this in the guitar shop in Crouch End, I played it and played it and played it. And Dave, the guy that owned the store, he said, you really want that, don't you? I went, yeah. And I went across the road to Eurydnik's office because my ex-wife Sandra and Kenny, sadly passed away, Kenny Smith, managed... Um, 
Eurythmics. I introduced them to Dave and Annie years before and they got into the family. So I went up to Kelly and I knew I had some money coming from a telly or something I had done. And I went, I found this guitar, you know, uh, and it's 1100 quid. And he went, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. And then years later, I saw this melody maker from yeah. 1959 in the same shop. I mean, it's good. This is the what this is the shop in Crouch End, yeah? Rock around the clock, yeah. Right, because I've got a feeling this is a shop that a friend of mine goes to. And we had a couple of guitars it's, that we sent up there. Sadly, it's not there anymore. It's I see. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, okay. David's so that, too no. retired. They bought a cottage somewhere, the owners, and okay. off they went. He had a bit of health problems, so they retired. But that oh, okay. was that, that was the hub for me. Right. In, um, Martin Chambers lived upstairs in one of the flats and he was our drummer in Spiritual Cowboys along with Ulla Roma, we had two drummers and Martin had a, a flat up there uh, we had many silly nights there, it was great and the guitar shop was downstairs and opposite, you know, just down there was Banners, the restaurant everybody used to go to Banners and it was a great fish and chip shop it was everything in Crochet <laughs> By the near the clock tower, it was just a great experience. I lived in Crouch End for about forty years. Oh, God, I saw people right. come, um, my the neighbour I made friends with first on the person that lived next door to me was John Amiel, the film director mm. <laughs> from Lipstick on My Collar. He started off with singing detective and all that, and then yeah, he did yeah, all yeah. The movies with Bruce Willis, etc., and all that. Yeah, yeah. he had uh, a collection as well. <laughs> He loved instruments. He had a sitar. He let me play the sitar. Bloody hell, that's hard. Yeah, he had I know. Acoustic. I've but tried and failed. Yeah, I, I couldn't sit because I've got a dodgy back. I couldn't sit like that for very long. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, it's really hard. Plus the bending is you bend in and up or yeah, in yeah. and down like that. It's hit and miss what you get out of the sitar. Yeah. It's good fun so long yeah. as nobody's listening to you because it must be <laughs> on the ears you know yeah. but John had a, he had a great big jukebox as well with some great stuff on it all sorts of gear you know like old Ella Fitzgerald right up to you know coming through Little Rich and all the rock and roll things right up to new age stuff and everything. he had some amazing music we had some fantastic parties there mm. uh, full of film stars and directors it was just great and sadly he moved away to LA, I haven't seen him since. Mm. But, uh, that was long. It's amazing. And yeah, good days. I, I cool. just made I just made friends with Gem, you know, Gem Archer from Oasis. He's with Noel Gallagher now, and he's another crowd gender. Uh, and when we get together, we always talk about guitars and rock around the clock, you know, um, just prattling on for ages about music. And it's really good to meet. Uh, contemporary guitar players that uh, have, you know, the same feelings as you about, uh, you know, the old um, Fender music masters or oh, right? yeah, yeah. one yeah. pick of all, all that sort of stuff. We just rattle on for ages. Great fun. Yeah, yeah. good. Brilliant stuff. Johnny, that was absolutely wonderful. Oh, good. Well, the story and it's didn't... nice to get anoraki about <laughs> guitars and stuff. I, I, only, I don't need much of an excuse. Um, yeah, I know. could talk for hours about things and um you know not being big headed but films film soundtracks i did with uh, mickey gallagher get carter and all that sort of stuff. great days oh we, we met some great people producers and roy, roy budd and jack fishman um i just uh, i had a great jam with sean lennon once uh where i said do you know your dad's songs he went yeah i know all of them I said, oh, show me Julia. You know, so he showed me the chords to Julia. It was, and he was playing it really beautiful. And we were jamming in the dressing room somewhere with Dave in Switzerland. And then he started playing like Zappa and then he started shredding. And I was like, what? And he was only young then. He was at finishing school, Sean. Um, but he had all that, you know, finger styly like his dad, all the way up to playing like Zappa or Dweezil Zappa, Frank Zappa, Dweezil yeah. Zappa. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. Really, yeah. really, really talented. And I was so glad when he got, um, he started making solo records. Because um, I think he's got good potential, good good voice, good talent, great, quite good songs now, Sean. Mm. Mm. 
about that. Cool. There you go. Well, <laughs> onwards well, and onwards and inwards. Yeah, yeah exactly. Here we go. Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, that's so so good. Thanks, Johnny. Cool. And um, it's nice. To, I mean, as you say, you could have gone on forever because you, you <laughs> you've done so much stuff. It's one o'clock. <laughs> It's one o'clock in China. <laughs> yeah, I could quote some more lyrics by Ian, but uh, I won't. I'll let it go at that. There must be what, sort of yeah. There must be yeah. few yeah embossed into your into your brain over the yeah. years. Yeah. All right, man. All right, Johnny. Thank you. So you I'll, I'll um I'll put some stuff on the show notes. Um, Brilliant and. Uh, Cool. Be, that's great. And thanks ever so much for your time. It was absolute yeah. storm. Nice to see you. All Good the to best. see you, mate. All Cheers. the best. Bye Cheers. now. Bye. Mm -hmm.